Good evening to everybody. I know I'm coming on early. Let me pull you guys up real quick. Uh, it is I'm actually seven minutes late. I'm starting this early because COT has some forward motion to begin on. Well, guys, I'll tell you this. We're going to have to go ahead and go forward. And I'm going to set up a special date uh, for some of you. Because I have to tell you a couple of things tonight. As we go through Revelation. But it's good to see everybody. Very good to see you guys. I can see COT. Good to see us, Grave Echo Farmer. Mayor Bears. Strong Arm. Red Marbles. I think I lost my marbles. And everybody else, God bless you. And good to see you out there. Good to see you guys out there. Hopefully, everybody is uh, doing okay today. Or to have you guys on full screen so now I can really see your comments. I can see what you guys are talking about now. Good to see you, Flash. Spruce. Pooh Bear. Vicky. Good to see everybody out there. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right, guys. Now, hopefully you guys have the recorders going. We're going to begin. We're going to go back into Revelation. I knew that some people are not going to be happy because they didn't get the, uh, it's not 7 p.m. yet. Hopefully they won't be too upset. But I'm not sure uh, how long this is going to last. So I'm never sure of that. But we're going to go for it. Right? Now, although, I want to tell you guys something. Although, our, the last conversation we had was just a candid conversation with you guys. I did not mean for you guys to start throwing donations in there. But God bless you for doing that. God bless you for doing that. I know I certainly did. I threw every last, I threw everything I could uh, into there. Do you guys know that COT, listen to this, this is this is good news. I didn't tell you guys this. I, no, actually I said this around three years ago. Three years ago. We had some debt in COT, you remember? Three years ago. We have approximately 11,000 11, left in debt for COT. Isn't that awesome? Now the only reason we're in debt, right? The only reason we're in debt and COT is because of, uh, you know, I'm stubborn. That's all. I'm just stubborn. And and anyway, but we're 11,000 now. We used to be at, uh, we were at 102,000. And so now we're at, uh, I believe it's 11,000, I believe. That is amazing and awesome. The way it looks, um, I've been given a, a, I have a request coming in for April. And so with the something small in April, that'll be gone. That'll be gone. So that's a blessing. It's good to be debt free, isn't it? It's good to be debt free. Hopefully we can stay that way, but that's up to that's gonna be up to all of us. And that'll be a rating on all of us. Listen, guys, listen to me. Please hear me tonight. If you've never heard me tonight, listen tonight. We all know that uh the aggression factor in the world is going up. We all know that. Uh, all of us have been reading in Revelation. At least you guys have been listening in Revelation. But we also know the stubbornness of humanity. Right? Not everybody is involved in a potential war. Not everybody. War is the last thing that we need. If we go to war, there are others who will uh, intervene in that war. There are others. As it was explained, there is a black mist over the earth, and it's growing, it's causing hostilities. And it's somewhat out of control because of inner greed, because of misguided ambitions which is quickly turning into hatred 
that's causing a problem. The mystery about the bottomless pit. So I may go into some of that and what I believe that is. If I talk to you guys about that, you have to read between some of the lines. But I hope, I pray that you take it seriously. Because there's something happening right now as people fall deeper into their own emotions. Right? You guys, every single believer out there, whether you admit it or not, you can feel the burden of the slip of the world of a very dark canopy that's covering the earth right now. It means everything. It is the change that's been spoken of for a long time. Now, a long time ago when they described these things in Revelation, right? can you imagine John looking and seeing something he had no context for? right? And forget about man's modern equipment forget about that most people in Revelation they have their context based in the technology we're exposed to today because that's all they can see that's all they can compare it to that's a big mistake it's a huge mistake very big mistake I know that it would be wonderful if the description of those things from the bottomless pit were in fact uh, some army in opposition to everything, right? be beautiful if that were the case. At least it would be something we understand. It's not going to be like that. I say that with a thousand percent surety. Mankind has become quite arrogant. Supernatural things have been distant from mankind for thousands of years. In the absence of supernatural things that are common to everybody, they have created their own narrative. They have taken the Bible. And they have rationalized the Bible. It's a big mistake. They're basing the Bible on what they can see, which is why they always change their interpretation of the Word of God. And it's almost like they can't believe any further. So and then this, this constant uh, journey to solve what the Bible is, and they do so with a modern-day comparison of what exists. Ninety percent of this world cannot be seen by the average person. 90% of this world can't even be seen by a special person. It just can't. But that's not going to be the case for long, and that's based on humanity's aggression factor. The Lord wants very specific, very kind, in allowing us to have this word, and it's up to us to protect the integrity of that word. And we have to be very careful with our interpretations to be very careful in what we think things are. People seek comfort. So if there's a comforting narrative out there to, for example, Revelation or, for example, certain bits of prophecy, people are going to grab onto that. They're going to keep it and it will weaken them. The Lord did not give us the word to weaken us, but to strengthen us. He gave us the truth. We've got to be careful not to dilute that truth. Because if we do, we're going to be weakened, and we won't be able to take what's actually going to happen. In fact, God gave us a few hints. He did. He already told us the wise people, the wise men, and the prophets, and everybody else is going to wonder why things are the way they are, that they have been greatly deceived. And the truth is, they deceive themselves. Whenever we call ourselves experts on a word, has been passed down for thousands of years. And we attempt to be the experts of that word through our own interpretation by our small exposure to life. We make grave mistakes. And in this case, it's going to cost a great many 
To know the word is one thing. To solve the word should be left to the most high. He said he would give us revelation concerning his word. All of us, not one of us. If a truth is going to be known, it's going to be given to all of us. A very simple but foolproof example of identifying the truth is this and how God gives that truth is this. If anybody were to say something that none of you could identify with, did God actually give that? No. He didn't. You see, because when God gives something, he gives that by the Spirit. He already said he would do that. And he would not give it in secret, which means he's not giving it to one person. He's giving it to everybody. In fact, how could you ever recognize a truth if you didn't have it too? If you did not have the truth about something, there's no way you would be able to recognize it. You couldn't make heads or tails of it. So God gives the truth to all of us. And those who have it strongly will say that truth, and the rest of the people can then say, yes, that is real. How do we know something is real? Because God gives it to all of us. Not one of us, not two of us, all of us. The entire Word of God. When you read the Word of God, your amazement does not really come by finding anything new. Your amazement comes when you know that something is true. The things in you that are in the Word, and when you read that Word, you'll say, Amen to that, Amen to that. That's what I thought in the first place. In fact, you'll find that when you follow the world, and then you read the Bible, you find out that God speaks about principles that you naturally had, but you were convinced the world was right. And when you get back to the Word, you say, you read something that was given by the prophets or the apostles, and then you say, that's what I thought in the first place. I knew to do that in the first place. How can you do that if the entire Bible is not in you also? This entire word, the entire Bible, God's truth, must be within you or you could not make heads or tails of anything in the word of God. You only get excited about the word of God when you know something is true. You have confidence when you know something is true. That is by internal confirmation. That comes from the Spirit. It's not coming from somebody deducing the truth. Logical deduction and reasoning skills, that's not what it's coming from. That's simple verification, spirit to spirit. A spiritual word, and you recognize that spiritual truth. That means the entire Bible is within you. That's what it means. God's truth is in you. Have you ever disagreed with the word of God? And looked at why you disagreed. Isn't it because you believed or wanted some, some method to be real in the world because it was more convenient? Or it didn't condemn you so bad? You knew the truth. Your frustration with righteousness, sometimes that happens. Because at the moment, you can't do that thing without losing everything. How would you even know that if the truth were not putting you? Are you guys starting to see that God gives all of us the truth? All of us. Every single last one of us. No tricks. He gives all of us the truth. And when you know that truth, that's when you say amen. Well, not only did he give you that word, he gave you his truth. And sometimes there are extraordinary circumstances that you read about that people try to explain, and you only accept them because they seem logical, but they do not verify within. For example, the bottomless pit. Out of everything you ever heard about the bottomless pit, you accept certain things people say in the absence of somebody speaking the absolute truth where you could verify it. Hmm? That's in the absence. Because you have no choice, you have nothing else to lean to you. Right? And so people say, okay, I can see that, but that, that's not confirmation of the truth. That's just verification that something could be. Right? 
Revelation from start to finish. Many people have used that type method in the absence of someone speaking truth because if anybody ever speaks the truth, you will be able to verify it. And truth will come forward. But what happens if you gain a base your life of something you accepted, not the truth? Those things that come out of the bottomless pit. People have proposed many things, correct? But the truth is, many don't exactly know what they are, do they? We do know one thing. They are highly organized. We know something else. They operate within the guidelines of the most time. We do know that. We know something else. They do exactly what God has commanded them to do. Don't we? So are they monsters that come up? Or are they simply spirits? People have theorized about these things. But what I'm asking you is not to theorize another day. Because if you theorize, and that's what you're waiting on, you're going to run a risk of you being put out of the game early. Here's a fact. 90% of what truly exists in this world, most have not seen. Those who have seen cannot explain it. It is not so easily explained. You can't do it. What if those things that came out of the bottomless pit were highly organized, different things that do not necessarily look threatening but by way of their action, are so precise in what they do, nobody would ever mistake them again if they saw them. What if you were to find out there are other civilizations you've never been introduced to? What if you find out since day one you've been protected and there are things that want to get to you badly, but they have no authorization to. And they will never breach that authorization. If you found that out, that would change quite a bit. If you knew the level of which you were hated by most of what exists on this earth, not humanity, but other things, that would change your outlook in quite a few things, wouldn't it? Many people would not be able to handle that. To know that something is out there right now that has access to you, but is simply not authorized to get to you yet. I believe that would change everybody's worship. And God doesn't want you to operate under threats. Have you noticed? There's a reason people are starting to see things now versus a few years ago. People are actually choosing against Christ. This is after their moment of clarity. In other words, many people have been with Christ for a long time. After all these years, they're giving up. That's a sign within itself. It's also a marker. And to give somewhat of a countdown to what humanity will have to face. Most people are curious about the Word of God. Most people who say things negative about the Word of God, they don't really know the Word of God. They certainly don't know Christ. But when you know Christ and have walked with Him, and you walk away, that's a different story. That's called a falling away. That's when people cast down their faith when they count it as nothing. And why would they do that? Because they're believing of their doctrine. See, the Lord told us, don't, don't look into other doctrines. He told us that. He said, keep the only doctrine we are to keep is that of the gospel. The apostle said the same thing. Unfortunately, that has not happened. 
and this suspected falling away is taking place. And as it does, violence increases. Okay? This violence is going to call something forward. Violence is the alarm clock. Many things are waiting on. Violence. And as you see violence being enhanced, you're also going to see current systems tore down in a way that you wouldn't expect because most people think it's going to be blatant. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be something they can say, okay, that's, that makes sense. It's not going to make sense. That's what a lot of people are not prepared about. What about your children? Listen to me. Children, right? They're nice now. They're going to school. They consider things. These kids are growing up. What are they actually choosing? What are they actually supporting? Anything that seems peaceful, accommodating, that doesn't tell you what it is or what it's going to do. And every single person has their own choice. But it just so happens we live in a time of somewhat of a divergence. As man continues to do this, they will invite. They will invite on the scene what we've been protected from. And that's not some joke. That's not some passive statement. It isn't. Nobody in their right mind would say anything like that, right? Well, I'm trying to tell you that if you conventionalize the word of God and try to rationalize it with what you can see today, you're making a huge mistake. God is quite serious about you. He's quite serious about you being kept and raised. You've been guarded this entire time. Do you not know because of believers? It's probably an entire race has been kept away from you. Likely more than a few. This entire time, things have been held back from you. And now the other side of humanity surfaces, the unbelieving part, and quite a few. And that barrier of greats it's going to be pulled from them. Not you, them. You know what that means, don't you? Suppose you have a good friend. They don't necessarily believe in Christ like you do. You try to talk to them about Christ. They don't want to talk. They don't want to talk. Not about Christ. They want to do everything else. They want to smile. They want to have a good time. They always influence you to do secular things. Many of you have a friend just like that. You know that if you start talking about Christ, you're going to drive them away, and so you don't. You do good things, and you try to teach them very uh, gently. But you don't know what their reaction is going to be if you just outright start talking about Christ or the principles of Christ. How many have a friend like that? How many have somebody in their lives that you have this feeling if you start talking about Christ, you won't have that friend or close one anymore? How many of you have somebody like that in your lives? And there's something in you holding your conversation of Christ back because you know it's going to jeopardize that relationship. And you don't want that relationship jeopardized. And so possibly for a long time you've said nothing about Christ too much. You have suggested, but not really said anything. Listen to me carefully. These people who are nice and smiling and everything else, but they do not want to discuss Christ or they always bring you back to some secular conversation or some secular thing. See, I want you guys to really understand this because these people 
right? When you're in a spiritual mood, they turn on the radio. When you want to praise the Lord, they flip on some sort of a weird movie. They try to get you involved in secular things to outweigh the spiritual things in your life. It's time for you to identify beyond your emotions that there are people out there that are rejecting Christ. They are. They don't want to discuss him. Listen to me. They're going to have to go through something terrible. That means the separation is coming, whether you like that or not. Please understand this statement. If I had a friend in my life, a person in my life, that did not want to hear anything about Christ, I can pray all day long. It is still up to that person to accept or not. God has afforded every opportunity for us to know who he is. He has afforded every opportunity to know who he is. He has and more time. The gospel is everywhere. There is no way a person can be distant from the gospel in this time. There's no way. And there are people who are turning it down. They don't want it. In our hearts, we have a hope that one day they will, but see that one day. That one day is going to run out. There's not going to be a one day left. We gotta be careful not to deceive ourselves and keep saying to ourselves, well, God's gonna give us time. He never said that. He never ever said that. He told us every single day was the day that we need to make a decision. He never told us to make somebody know who he is. Nope. No. Yeah. Didn't he say he would reach everybody? The gospel of the kingdom would be preached throughout all the earth, not accepted, preached. Didn't he say that? Yes. So then everybody has an opportunity to choose, and everybody is going to have that moment of clarity. Listen to me. No one is going to pass, die in this life until they have had that moment of clarity. And what is that? The moment of clarity is when you absolutely know in a very special time who the Messiah is. What he actually did in truth without distractions. No foggy thought, no anything. It's going to be an absolute moment of clarity. Everybody receives that. And at that moment, people make a choice. The folks who continue to say no and push away and operate by these secular spirits, They will be separated. A day will come. And they will be separated. They will gather with those who are like them. Leaving you. When that day approaches, you know that the Lord has started his last process. What you have to do is have an understanding that by free will, one chooses Christ. By free will. And it's always going to be up to that person. Whether they choose or not. Some have to go through some heavy things before they choose. Some of us had to go through heavy things. Right? We did. We did. Some of those people are going to have to go through heavy things, but they're not going to have the time you did. They're not. Don't question their timing, though. God made them a certain way to be a more resilient in certain areas than we are. But you might want to get yourselves ready, because if a person does not know this, if a person is not aware... That the very things they may love may not love the Lord. 
and that they will be separated, it could cause them to fall. See, many things can cause a Christian to fall, and ultimately, ultimately, the only ones that are going to be left standing are those who didn't shake through all God's processes. Your father is going to shake everything. Everything. He's going to shake. Everything is going to. You're going to shake. I'm going to shake. Everything is going to shake. The only things that will be left standing are those things that refuse to give up. Can a loved one make you give up? Yes, I've seen it. I've seen a Christian who loves the Lord, renounce the Lord for the sake of a loved one. Listen, if any person on earth has that power over you that you would give your heart to them over and above the Most High. There's no way you can stand with the Most High, ever. If you look carefully over your life, your challenge has been this. God has been asking one specific question. You know what it is? With every issue that comes in your life, is that issue strong enough to make you Betray him. Do you hear me? With every issue in your life, and believe me, it is thorough. Some people, they lose everything. Is that a strong enough situation to cause them to turn away from the living God? To turn away from the family? To turn away from righteousness? Look at everything in your life. Is God trying us? He's simply bringing us through a process. A process of surety where nobody can lie. Nobody can fake it to get in there. Nobody. Nobody. And every tool and everything he gave us was in helping us to both know him to recognize him, to see his position of love concerning us. He already told us if we ever choose him or the circumstance, he'll empower us to get through the circumstance. Do you see that? Anybody who chooses the most high over their circumstance will be helped through their circumstance. No trial to date has been able to take any of you. None. Do you know that? Not, not one of them. Not one of them. When your heart is with him and you find yourself weakened to the point where you're ready to give up, he is the one that called you back. That's his faithfulness. Is it not? Is your life not a testimony of that very thing? That when you choose him, with all your honesty, with all your weaknesses, he knows you're prone to weakness and everything else. He's the one that's been calling you. He called you out of that situation. He called you out of that circumstance. He called you out of that choice you were about to make because you still had him on his throne. You want to be family with him. And that's being qualified. See, didn't he have first creations, Lucifer, other angels, a multitude of angels. They were made eternal with knowledge. They knew they had knowledge. They were eternal. They were gifted and made with gifts. Anything he assigned them, they could go and carry out. But guess what? There were circumstances with human beings that were enough to cause them to fall. With Lucifer, his emotional state, him seeing his own beauty was enough to make him fall. He thought himself to be higher, more valuable above the living God. He found his way to be more excellent than the living God. So by seeing himself through vanity, he betrayed the Father. He did not honor him. He saw himself to be beautiful. He saw himself complete. And instead of thanking the Father, 
because he knew he was created instead of thanking the Father for what the Lord had given him. Guess what he did? He sought to ascend his throne above the living gods. He was a covering cherub. He was in charge of other angels, and he saw his position higher than what God appointed. You know, that happens in earth a lot. When people see their position higher than what God appoints, and the very first thing they do is they start to edify themselves. They start to brag on themselves. That happens. Satan did that. Now we know our Father is love, and the Bible it says God is love. Let me ask you something. Do you think Satan falling and the fallen angels falling? Because God made them not like robots to do everything he says without question, no. They had to choose to do good. Do you think that that broke the Father's heart? In the Bible it says that we, mankind, grieved. He grieved God that he made man. Do you know why he grieved God that he made man? Because of what he had to do. Because he did not make us robots to obey him. He didn't do that. Let me ask you guys something. When Satan fell one-third of the angels, and that happened prior to mankind, and then Satan influenced Adam in the garden, which is to say, Satan got to mankind, and mankind fell. Because of the same thing, Lucifer. The, 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 listen, do you know how Eve fell according to Genesis? Same way Lucifer did. Do you know that? The same thing. Many people say they teach people in Sunday school Lucifer fell because of pride. Define that. Let me define it for you. He disobeyed God. How? How? This is very important. How? How did he disobey God? What was the ultimate thing he did? You got to know this. What was the ultimate thing Satan did? Anybody? What did he end up doing in his prideful act? You know what he did? You ready? You know that feeling you get inside you when you see somebody who's a little lesser than you are? That's the first mistake. You start seeing somebody lesser than you are, but somehow they're getting along better than you are. All of us know that feeling. Every single last one of us know that feeling. Our father said that we're going to know that feeling. And we start feeling that emotion of envy. Strife is not far behind it. So we start coming up, these thoughts come up from us. That person thinks they're, they're better than everybody. Right? I should be in that position. I can do that. Why didn't they give that to me? And that person has it. All of us know exactly what that is. That's why you were put in a situation in your life, just like the word says, where it would elicit that response that you would know what it is so that you would not be ignorant concerning it. You know exactly what it is. In fact, God said, all these stories in the Bible, do you not know that your trials are connected to every story in the Bible? Do you know why? So that you could relate to both the enemy and the living God so that you would know the circumstances in truth. So that you would know what you're reading. All of us have felt that before and we know what that feeling is. And when we have that feeling, is there any niceness in us for that person? No. There's no niceness in us for that person. And if we take it further and act on that, what happens? Hmm? What happens? What happens? Let me say it simply. Satan began to see himself more than the creator. And in so doing in his own mind, he demoted the creator. Do you hear me? He demoted the creator in his own heart that he would act to set his throne above God's. 
The only way he could do that is if he thought within himself that the creator was less than he was. And how did all this come about? Come on now. How did it come about? The Bible tells us what? How could Satan ever compare himself to the living God? You only read that of him. You read it of no one else. Here it is. He saw himself. He saw himself. Do you hear me? He saw himself. He saw himself as what? He saw his own beauty. He began to see his own worth. He compared himself. A oh, problem. The mirror. Your eyes. He saw himself, and he began to build himself up more than the living God by seeing himself. That's right. He saw himself greater than the living God. Now, with Eve, Eve did the same thing. Do you guys know that? Do you guys know that? In Genesis, Eve did the same thing. How did Eve fall? A lot of people say, well, Eve sinned, and Adam and Eve sinned. Of course they did, but how'd that happen? How'd that happen? You guys know how that happened? God was very clear in the garden. He gave them instruction. And anybody could have followed that. He told them they could eat of any tree out there, but they could not eat of the tree of life. You guys remember that? Oh, the tree of good and evil. He told them that, didn't he? What did Satan say, though? Satan approached them. Do you guys remember that? Satan approached them. And what did Satan say? Here's what the Bible says. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. More subtle. What does that mean? What does that mean? All the rest of the beasts of the field, they made noise. They were obvious and everything else, right? Not the serpent. He was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, or, hey, may. More subtle. Now, if you're subtle, you go, hey, hey, hey there. Hello. How you doing? A thought. That's how thoughts come into your head. Now, follow me on this. That's exactly how thoughts come into your head. Not loud. They don't come loud. They ease up on you. Thoughts do, don't they? They ease into your mind. And before you know it, you're in deep thought about something you did not originate. Now you don't know the difference. You may have a thought and say, hey. You remember that person over there, what they did in high school? You remember that person over there? Hey, you've got some extra money. Why don't you go get something for yourself? He said, hey, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Can you imagine Eve? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm doing this on purpose. Can you imagine Eve sitting there, right? She's thinking, hmm, how did God did God say did God say don't eat of every tree? Why no? He just said don't eat of that tree. Well, I wonder why he said don't eat of that tree. Isn't that how we do when we think? If you look carefully in Genesis, follow me on this. You look carefully on, in Genesis. Is it not your thought process? You're sitting there minding your own business. All of a sudden a thought comes in. A challenge thought. Now a challenge thought is when you have a set of parameters. Say you're at work. You're at your job, something like that, and you have a challenge thought. What a challenge thought is, is you begin to rehearse your own instructions. Well, I, I, does the Bible say that we can't drink alcohol? Oop, 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 oop. Does the Bible say we can't smoke weed? Is that what the Bible says? It didn't say smoke, right? Weed is of the earth. It's natural. Isn't that how we do? Am I saying weed is bad? Nope, I'm just being subtle. I say drinking is bad? Nope, just being subtle. That's just how your mind works. You don't get a thought that comes in and says, hey, is smoking poison ivy terrible? I bet you don't get that thought. Let me, let me continue. So it has to be something good, right? 
It, what I'm telling you is it can't be something awful. It's got to be something good. Right? You don't get a voice that comes into your head and says, hey, why don't you go smoke some poison ivy? That voice does not come. Nope. You get the good stuff. Something that is controversial is what I'm trying to tell you. You always get something controversial. You may not even understand it and something controversial will come in. That same thing happened to Eve. Who was it? It was a serpent. It was a serpent. Right? Now, what did he continue to say? He said, Hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, This is how we do. Nobody there, but this is how we do. Not a soul will be there. This is how we do. The woman said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And that's exactly how we do. Well, the Bible didn't say anything about not smoking. It talked about strong drink and drunkenness. It didn't say anything about smoking. That's exactly how we do. Yet people say, well, I haven't seen Satan. Really? Let's continue. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. See, listen, do we not have conversations in our heads just like that? Hmm? Don't we have conversations just like that with an answer in our heads? And we never analyze it, which is shocking. Never analyze it. Here we go. So, a question is brought up of something God said. Don't eat of that one tree. The serpent says, hey, the challenge. Did God say you can't eat? You know, you can't eat of every tree in the garden? No, she says. God says we can eat of every tree but that tree. And then Satan says this. And the serpent says, this is uh, chapter 3, Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Do you see that? You see that? That's the fulfillment of the challenge. To find error with the initial instruction. To find a loophole with the initial instruction. To get technical with the initial instruction. To add details that were not there before. And to create a desire where there not, was none. There was no desire for her to even look at that tree. Come on now, follow me. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be opened. You shall be, as, you shall be as God's knowing good from evil. Did you hear that? Now Satan fell because he saw himself as a God, essentially. Now guess how he influences the woman? Huh? What does he tell the woman? You're not going to really die. But God knows, God already knows that if you do this, you're going to be just like he is. You're going to be equal with him. You're going to be equal with him. Equal with what? With the authority. What is that? Jealousy, envy, all that stuff. The same thing that happens to everybody on planet Earth over and over again. The same entry point. The same exact thing. Let me continue so you don't get lost. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that's why I'm stopping. Now, before this conversation, she wasn't looking at the tree. Before this conversation, the instructions were enough, and she was happy. When the conversation came up, Satan's purpose was to have her look at the tree, to reassess the tree. Anybody ever do that before? Well, did they say this? Or let me, let me go deeper into it. And as soon as you go deeper, that's where the trouble starts. Life is so simple until you go deeper into things that you should have left alone. And normally you go deeper into things because you're defiant and outspoken and nobody's going to tell you what to do. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Because you're going to run your own life, right? You're going to do your thing. Look where that got us. 
That's philosophy of the world. But we know whose philosophy that truly is, don't we? Don't we? Don't we? So, verse 6 is when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Wait, let, me, let me finish uh, 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 what she saw. It was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desire to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. So, what ultimately happened with that challenge thought of authority? Satan created a desire within her. But what was that desire based off of? What was it based off of? Her going to another level. Her going up higher. Do you see that? She was put at a specific level. Satan introduced a conversation to make her think of going higher, to be equal with God, to have no limitations, to take off all the barriers and restrictions. She became instantly rebellious and had a strong desire to break the fence she was in. You see that? She wanted to break out, be more. Listen to me, she wanted to be more. She wanted to be more. She wanted to be more. God made her one thing. As soon as she talked to Satan, she wanted to be more. I should be more than this. That's why. Listen, because she instantly compensated. Because she wanted to be more. When somebody wants to be more, they justify the breaking of the barrier. How do they do that? It says here, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. And it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, God said, leave it alone. Don't Just leave it alone. Don't eat it. But he did not tell them. Why did he? He, he just said, in the day you do, you're surely going to die. But he gave no details. What did Satan do? Come on, follow me on this. What Satan does all the time is he does this. He will challenge that simple rule, the simple barrier, the simple instruction. He'll have you challenge that, look deep into it, break it apart, and create a desire in you to be more, to be much more. So that you can do what? Why does she want to be more? Why does she want to be like God's and know good from evil? Like God would. That's stupid, isn't it? Because when you do this, you no longer accept that God is your God. You don't have a God anymore. You become your own God. I hope you're listening. You become your own God. You become your own power. You become your own answer to your own prayers. You don't have to wait on anybody. You don't have to be patient. You make things happen. What does that sound like? Sounds like a pep rally for one of these corporations in the world, doesn't it? You make things happen. You take charge. You be in control. You be your own boss. All those good sayings that get people that just destroy people's lives. Huh? No submission. Submission is a bad word. You say submission, and people start walking away. Oh, I'm not submitting. Nobody can tell me what to do. Isn't that right, saints? So she ended up having the same mindset Satan did. Uh-oh. The same mindset Satan did. God made her one thing, and he had his process. Satan introduced something God never did. And what is that? The details. Lord have mercy. The details. Well, I got to know more. Well, I got to have, you know what? In no case did having details enrich a person's life. You know what it did do? It caused their life to be stagnant. It caused them to do things they shouldn't. Because God will educate you in his time, but it's almost like nobody trusts his timing. Why? Why does no one trust the timing of the Most High? And what is the timing of the Most High? He will grant you understanding as you're able to walk in what he just gave you. 
if God gives you something and you walk in obedience and you understand it, you walk in obedience, you're a good steward over it, by the way, which is his principle. Become a good steward over it. He'll add to you. And you know what people are saying? No, I don't want that. No, I want it all right now. Right now, I want it all. And they will not walk in what they just had. It's the same tactic from Satan. Eve did it too. She saw herself more than what God made her to be. She didn't even know what God made her to be. She saw herself more than what God made her to be. Folks, listen to me. Satan saw himself more than what God made him to be. Right now. Right now. I wonder. What all these people think. You can hear the echo in everything they say. Right here in Genesis. This same tactic is everywhere right now. And it's getting to everybody. People are alive right now. And they do not accept what God made them to be. Because they don't know what God made them to be. Did Eve know what God made her to be? Nope. Because if she did, she would have not listened to the serpent. So what did Jesus do? He spent time telling you exactly who you are, didn't he? Do not all his teachings tell you who you are? Yes, he did. He told you exactly who you are. He told us exactly what to do. But there's another voice in the earth, isn't it? A voice that competes with the Lord's voice. And the same way Satan fell, so will a great many others. How many people have heard me speak and they said to themselves, I know all of what he's talking about. Why is he up there talking? You don't have to answer that. I just know it's there. I know it's there. I want you to analyze that. Identify where these thoughts are coming from. Not about me, though, but about yourselves. Because God made you to be something. He did. God made the people in your homes to be someone. He made that special person that will not give God time of day. He made them to be someone. Listen to me. Many are taking the way of Satan. And to take the way of Cain is to seal that way of Satan. Eve took of the fruit of good and evil in defiance of the living God trying to be like God. She saw that fruit to make one wise, like God. That's the only thing missing from this. It was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. Satan used the comparison like God to make you smarter than the competition, to make you smarter than the standing authority, to put you on top of the world while everybody else is on the bottom of the world. Right? Right? Are you guys with me? Isn't that the thought? That you want to be above the other person? That you want to match and go beyond a certain level? Right? Isn't that the mindset of the world? Isn't that the entire communication of the world over and over again? In every movie? In every song? Everywhere. It's everywhere. In every speech? Even in policy? It's called competition, isn't it? Competition works when you evaluate yourself and somebody else. It's exactly what Satan did. When he looked at himself and he said, I'm better than my creator. It's why CEOs want to be the next president to make the president lose their job and their shareholdings and they take their position. Isn't that how the world works and runs? 
But whose way is that? Whose way is that? Whose way is it? It's not our Father's way. It is not our Father's way. Do you know how many people don't know that? They don't know that. Because they love competition, don't they? Huh? They justify competition, don't they? They reject the Father's way, don't they? Come on now, dig down deep and listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. Maybe it'll cushion the blow when every idol on earth is torn down. Every idol. Maybe you'll contemplate this when you start seeing yourself because if you see yourself and you've compared yourself to somebody else, that's when the voice arises when you compare yourself to somebody else. Newsflash. Somebody said the B system in action has precisely what it is. Thank God somebody got it. That's precisely what it is. And it cannot be seen by those who partake of it. It cannot. It can't be seen by anybody who partakes of it. No wonder in Revelation it said the world worshipped the dragon and they worshipped the beast. But what did our Father say? Come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins, that you won't partake of her plagues. People want to know when the plagues are coming so they can let go the day before. Sorry. People are touching the plagues now. And it's spreading like wildfire. And when it has reached enough, it'll activate and do what it needs to do. Hmm? Somebody said, Brother Mike is being competitive out of fun wrong. I don't do the fun thing. In all honesty, I don't. Every Listen, I can have joy with education with children always. I never seek to have fun because it's not fun to me. I'm an oddball. It's just not fun to me. It's not fun to me because it fights against the fundamental ways of our Father. Oh, and by the way, right, fun is how many things enter. Many things will enter that way. See, it's the harmless ways of this world. I don't get you. It'll get you. It'll get you and hold you, and then you'll end up defending it. In Revelation, the people that are left in Revelation defend the ways of the world. They defend it. See, there's a task and a message that will go out in the end days that will not support these things of the world. And that message, that message will be real. But it's not going to be liked. It's going to be hated. Hated. Mm -hmm. Joy is different from fun. It is. Different. Like a game of football with children, right? What values do you teach a child? I normally teach kids about life. And I always tell them, right? In the games of the world, and I always say that, the world. The, in the games of the world, somebody always has to lose. I always teach them that. Somebody has to lose. But that's part of the game of the world. Right? That's part of the game of the world. Somebody has to lose. So when you lose, you don't get sad. You don't frown. That's part of the game. The purpose of the game, right, is to collectively win. When the other team loses, always make sure to lift them up. Because it's only a game. 
I'm, I'm, I'm very careful to let them know that's a game of the world. I make that distinction clear. I do that because I know they're going to go out and play those games. They're going to be in high schools and everything else, right? You can't forbid a child from doing that when they're in somebody else's care. They're going to be exposed to games. You, you keep hammering that phrase home. They're going to grow up and say, ha, ah, these games are of the world. And when they start reading the Bible, they're going to say, our father does not play games. The world does. They'll make that distinction between the world and our father because it should be a distinction. Never some bridge that makes it one and the same. Through these ways, even identifying these ways, you're going to find, you all who love the Lord, you're going to see that the world does not identify them. They don't identify them, they can't relate to them. That's what you're going to see. There is someone running this world behind the world. It is not our Father, though he protects you from what the world would like to do to you. But our Father made it clear. These kingdoms of this earth are not kingdoms of our Lord yet. Not yet. So we know who they're from, and now you know they run by that same philosophy. From the beginning, an age-old philosophy that was set forth at the beginning by Lucifer himself. That same philosophy is embedded into everything. And you have to live in this world and survive in this world. That's why you have to make a distinction. You have to understand what you're working in. So that when it starts to crumble, you won't crumble. See, when the world starts to crumble, if you're part of the world, you're going to crumble with it. There's no promise in that for you. But if you make that distinction, if you really make that distinction, you cannot be trapped another day. You're not a prisoner another day, and you're actually out of it. Do you understand? To come out of something is not to run away from the country. You can't come out of something that way. You're coming out of it by not living by its doctrine. Hmm? Yeah, that works. 